Welcome, everyone. Uh, many of you know me. Uh, my name is Scott Korb. I'm the director of the first year writing program at Eugene Lang College. And um, we're doing something that we do every week uh, at Eugene Lang, which is a uh, craft lesson lunch series. Only today we're doing something a little bit different. Um, we're live streaming today, um, reaching the public in a broader way, I hope. And um, at the same time, I want to welcome all of you who have come every week uh, to this series. Um, I'm very excited to be here today with a couple of my dear friends and colleagues, um, Ellen Bass, a chancellor of the Academy of American Poets, and Miller Oberman, uh, assistant professor of first year writing at Eugene Lang. They will be having a rich conversation today um, about Miller's poems. And next week, they will be talking about Ellen's poems for her new book, Indigo. Uh, just a few other things to say about Ellen. Um, she has written many books of poems um, and her, as I say, her latest is called Indigo, and she is also a member of the faculty at the Pacific University MFA in writing program. Um, I'm very eager to hear this conversation, and Ellen, I will turn it over to you. Take it away. Thanks so much. I'm very happy to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me. I'm really excited to talk with Miller about your poems, and maybe you would start by reading some poems for us. Yeah. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm very excited to be back at Craft Lesson Lunch, even though just from my house. Um, I would say that I, I like it when we can all be together, but I'm really excited to be here with Ellen. Um, yeah, so I'm going to start out by reading just a couple of poems from my book, um, The Unstill Ones. Um, and then I'm going to read a couple of new poems, and Ellen and I will talk about them. Um, so I'm going to start by reading this poem on trans. Um, which I've read many, many times now, um, but I think it's like speaking to me in a new way um, from isolation. Um, it begins, the process of through is ongoing. The earth doesn't seem to move, but sometimes we fall down against it and seem to briefly alight on its turning. We were just going. I was just leaving, which is to say coming elsewhere, transient. I was going as I came. The words move through my limbs, lungs, mouth, as I appear to sit peacefully at your hearth, transubstantiating some wine. It was a rough red. It was one of those nights we were not forced by circumstances to drink wine out of mugs. Circumstances being, in those cases, no one had been transfixed at the kitchen sink long enough to wash dishes. I brought armfuls of wood from the splitting stump. Many of them, because it was cold, went right on top of their recent ancestors. It was an ice night. They transpired visibly, resin to spark, bark to smoke, wood to ash. I was transgendering and drinking the rough red at roughly the same rate, and everyone who looked saw. The translucence of flames beat against the air, against our skins. This can be done with or without clothes on. This can be done with or without wine or whiskey, but never without water. Evaporation is also ongoing. Most visibly in this case, in the form of wisps of steam rising from the just washed hair of a form at the fire whose beauty was in the earth's turning that night and many nights transcendent. I felt heat changing me. The word for this is trans desire. But in extreme cases, we call it trans-dire. Or when this heat becomes your maker, we say trans-sire. Or when it happens in front of a hearth, trans-fire. Um, I'm going to read this poem called The Unmaking, um, which, again, I don't think I usually read this, but it, it was speaking to me differently this month. Um, and it's kind of about <laughs> the world being undone. Um, the Unmaking. At the winter fires, they used to tell that come the unmaking, houses would slowly, at the speed of trees growing, ungrow, become trees again, untimbered, and baked bread become grain, then wheat, then seed. Likewise, glass burn back to sand, sand to shells, stones, Everything wound would unwind, shot, sink to ore, drawn deep in the ground. If your voice is the one still running clear when the sun comes up, 
the listeners undress you, lift you on their shoulders, pour you in a sea soak. Then all you recalled singing is called back to salt, not lost, but unlost, absorbed in skin, skin riveted, then sloughed off again in time. Um, I'm going to read one more poem uh, from my book, which I think sort of leads into uh, one of the newer poems, maybe both of the newer poems that we're going to talk about. Um, um, this poem is called on, on Fishing. There was too much of my father last night. He kept me through every brown hour awake. Usually my fear is forgetting him, his particulars, his expressions, afraid of his face becoming a statue. But last night I said, stop that. Stop being so realistic, reminding me you were only eight years older than I am now when your heart fisted itself in the kitchen. We were making peach butter. There is too much kitchen now, too many pots and carrots and tiles. The stovetop with electric burners, he used to flick ground coffee on so I could watch it flare. Now it's flaring again. I wish it would stop. He stopped short as a line caught in a fish's cheek. There are too many fish now. My bed is full of scales and blood, sinkers and bobbers and boats. All that tackle in my sheets is distraction from fear. Dumb fish, I'm swimming at the lure. How embarrassing to be a person. Afraid to die, afraid to sleep. I used to sleep in my clothes. He forbid it. I said, why? He said, you cannot sleep in your clothes. I said, why? He said, you cannot sleep in your clothes. I said, why? He said, it's just not done, that's all. He didn't know why. We fought many nights on the stairs. He was kind, I see that now. Not to say sleeping in your clothes will not make you ready. Um, so I'm gonna read um, this newer poem uh, called Tahara. And then I think Ellen and I will talk about it a little bit. And then I'll read another poem and we'll talk about that one. Um, this poem is, um, I said it was newer and I just wanna to say to my students especially, but all students out there, when I say that, I mean that it's like a year old. <laughs> and, and by a year old, I mean for the last year, I felt pretty comfortable with where it's at um, and have basically stopped revising it. Um, but it can take a long time to make work. And, I think it's useful to remember that, um, especially since we have so much time now. Tahara, I'm wondering about you, Hevra Kadisha, the holy society who will prepare my body once I'm no longer in it for the earth. Will you know me already or see me for the first time as you wash and shroud me, as my father was washed and dressed in simple white takrahim for those about to stand before God? Perhaps by then I'll know if I believe in God. I like the democratic nature of the shroud and equalizing garment. You may see a body that surprises you. You may not have seen a man's body like this one before you, which I hope is very old, wrinkled, and since I'm wishing, fit, muscled as much as an old man can be. You'll see scars, ragged dog bit forearm, Elbow my father picked gravel from over the sink, then flushed with foaming iodine, and the long double horizons on my chest, which trunked my body like a tree. If I am unexpected, let me not seem grotesque to you, as I have to many people, perhaps even my own parents, and others whose highest kindness was to say nothing. Please let me return to dust in peace, as the others did, and recite those beautiful psalms, remembering as you go about your holy ritual, how frightening it is to be naked before another at the mercy of a stranger's eyes without even any breath. Oh, thank you, Biller. Wow. I've been reading these poems, but it's really, really special to hear them in your voice and to be familiar with them and then hear them anew. 
I'm excited to talk to you about these poems because I think they're really wonderful. And the I would like to just do a, a kind of semi-close reading with you of this one and then the next one as well, and also ask you some more general questions. And one of the things that really interested me right away in this poem is the pacing at which information is revealed. Mm -hmm. I thought it was incredibly deftly done. And we keep finding out more and more about the speaker of this poem as we go along. And everything we find out feels that it's been so well prepared for, uh, but we didn't know it until it comes. But there's a, a kind of extraordinary naturalness about the way in which the, uh, the, the facts and the narrative are revealed to us. What's my question? <laughs> I just keep one appraising the poem. Um, I, I, but maybe I'll point out a couple other things and then maybe you can speak a little bit mm -hmm. about to whatever one of them you want to. The other thing that really interested me is how you've combined so many tones in this poem. It starts out incredibly conversational. I'm wondering about you, just right there. And then in the middle, there's this humor which is, it's, it's been kind of serious. And then we have this humor, since I'm wishing, fit, muscled, uh, as much as an old man can be. And then as we move toward the end, the diction really rises up into this great gravitas at the end, how frightening it is to be naked before another at the mercy of a stranger's eyes without even breath. And there... I think about how this poem becomes so universal. This is about this particular speaker, how frightening it is to be naked before another. But of course, all of us at, at the mercy of a stranger's eyes. And then that without even breath, it's that it takes your breath away. Mm -hmm. And what it really made me think about was Rilke. And I, I looked up that passage again for beauty is nothing but the beginning of terror, which we are barely able to endure. And it amazes us so, because it serenely disdains to destroy us. Every angel is beautiful. Were you thinking of him when you wrote it or after you wrote it? No, I wouldn't, but it's a very flattering thought. <laughs> I mean, amazing, and the passage that you just read is so beautiful. I wasn't thinking about him. I was um, I was reading like a there's a Jewish mourner's handbook that I was reading, and I th I mean in one way it's an example of how um, and I think probably all literature is a good example of this, but how what we read comes out in what we write. Um, and I I wasn't reading Rilke, but I was reading this this Jewish mourner's handbook, and I think actually that really speaks to the first comment that you were making about pacing because it's so useful um, to have something like that, um, to like break down the pacing of these rituals for us. Um, and it's why I think we reach towards religion and ritual in these difficult moments. And it's so useful to have something like that, to say like, here are all the steps you go through and here's what happens. And it slows it down for you. Um, and I think major disruptions in life, um, like death, um, is this rupture. And it slows down time and it creates this lyrical moment. Um, and so I think having those rituals helps us exist in that time. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I don't know a great deal about the Tahara, but I, I do know that you say something um, along the lines of uh, forgive us, for any indignities that we may be um, doing here as we as we wash your body. And that dignity is so in this poem, um, it's especially there at the end. Yeah, it's an amazing ritual. Um, and I think as, um, as like part of being a queer person, right, is like this sense that there are all of these rituals 
um, that we are cast outside of um, and trying to find ways back into them and to have them for ourselves. So is part of, I think, growing up and continuing to be alive um, and to ask people to think about those too. Um, maybe the coolest thing that happened after this poem was published as part of the Poem A Day series is that someone, um, someone who's part of this uh, queer Jewish organization called Keshet in out of Boston, I think, um, like emailed me and they said, we're actually making a like book right now for queer Hebra Kedisha to you. Oh. And can we put your poem in it? And Wonderful. I was like, that's so cool. And so there's a book that they made and this poem is like the first page of it. Um, and I was That's like, beautiful. wow, what a great like action, sort of um, activist action to have come out of an artistic expression. That's, that's so wonderful. And sometimes uh, I've been asked by developing writers who are struggling with wanting to write something that's going to be useful to others. And I think this maybe is a good example. I'm sure when you wrote it, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that you weren't thinking about trying to do a public service. No, I don't think you, you were, can. You can't. No, you were thinking about writing the poem as, as true to yourself and the craft as you possibly could. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really the way to do it. And then afterward, sometimes, a poem does a lot of work in the world, but I don't think you can set out to do it, can you? No, I think that's such a good point because I know I've, I've been in a back and forth with one of my students this week, you know who you are if you're here, but about like, what's the point of any of this right now? Um, what's the point of studying literature right now? What's the point of being in school? And I think lots of us are asking these kinds of questions. And I think one answer is you don't know the utility of what you're doing while you're doing Absolutely. it. And, and that, I think, is an artist's answer, for sure. Um, Absolutely. That's beautiful. I wanted to just talk about a couple of tiny things here, and then uh, maybe we'll move on to the next poem about which I really think I could talk for all day about. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to point out this noun, this amazing noun, and the long double horizons on my chest. I think that's so beautiful, horizons in that way, and then the verb, which trunked my body like a tree. And, you know, for those of you who are just beginning to write poems or developing poets, just do that. <laughs> just make those kind of nouns and verbs. That's quite where, where it becomes such a metaphor. Yeah. Um, yesterday in class, actually in my, um, writing the essay to class, uh, we were talking about a Mahmoud Darwish poem, um, I Belong There, um, where he takes apart all of the words to make the single word home. Um, and in that, there's a phrase that um, he uses where he says something like in the, in the deep horizon of my word. And it's so brilliant because it builds out, it builds out a word into a physical space. And I, I think, that I was trying to do something like that there. The word horizon is kind of magical that way. Um, mm, and it's perfect here. I guess the last thing, though, I want to say is this wonderful phrase, others whose highest kindness was to say nothing. And I thought often in beginning, poets want to tell us some kind of wisdom or uh, what we should do the, to the reader. And I thought that this was such a, a subtle and beautiful way to make us reflect on our own behavior because you're not telling the reader what they should do. You're just saying, this is what I've experienced, that sometimes the highest kindness is to say nothing. Mm -hmm. And I thought about that a lot after reading this poem. And again, I, I just want to point out that strategy of how you ask us to reflect on ourselves without asking anything of us. That's interesting. I had not thought of it that way exactly, but I, yeah. We can't help but, yeah. but think 
oh boy, when have I opened my mouth mm -hmm. when maybe I should have just kept it shut? I yeah. thought that was wonderful. Okay. Okay. W would you would you would you read for us? Joshua was gone, and then we're gonna put it up on the screen and talk about it in in some more detail. Yeah. Um, yes. So I'll I'll just say this poem is in a form, um, which I know we'll talk about, but it's a quite a strict form um, where um, each each stanza has to use every letter of the alphabet except for one. Um, and so you mean it, it's a great form to practice because it really sends you to your dictionary. Um, and I think, um, so this poem is called Joshua Was Gone. And so there's a stanza for every letter of the name Joshua. Um, and you can't use the J in the first stanza and the O in the second stanza and so on. And so it's a really wonderful form for any time you're trying to write something and you're struggling with it. Um, because you can never say straight out the thing that you're writing about. Um, it's called A Beautiful Outlaw, the, the name of the form. Um, and this was a poem that I think that I had been trying to write for 15 years, and I never could do it. And I, I started working in the form, and then it really helped me. Um, Joshua was gone. And in his place, one royal blue kid on the floor of Papa's closet, under the hanging button-down shirts and sport coats, houndstooth and herringbone. In amongst his softball cleats, his favorite slippers, his green stained mowing the lawn sneakers, his mahogany tasseled loafers, a tin of boot wax. I sat there rarely and always alone to touch it. There in the lacquered dark, in the smell like leather soaked up the sun, then leaked it out gradually, I looked at my dead brother's shoe, the zigzag tread pretty worn, the dirty white rubber trim and shoelaces. And in his place, we played fiery lava. We played stick knife fights, capture the flag, hide and seek. We played kittens in the laundry basket. We served tea in tiny painted cups. Papa carved and painted pickup sticks and we carefully picked them up. We fried marbles, saw them sear and crack. We hunted amethyst quartz. I retrieved a baby bunny snared in the pricker bush and we fed her with a syringe. We played jacks, jinx, wiffle ball, rummy, wink murder, and we sang. And only one picture of him in the long hall of many that looked even longer then, in the top left corner of one collage. He looked golden brown-eyed and gleaming, bronze little fox. He looked out awarely. He looked like a toddler, face of a puzzle, face of a pip, face of an orchid, mouth of a plum, jaw of a hill of waving wheat, chin of a quince, neck of a gentle mountain, collarbone of wind over water. And in your place, an empty place, you, can I call you, you? Gone boy, never to outgrow a sneaker, a faded picture. And if Papa wept, lit a candle some calendar day, you were born or died. I didn't know about it. Papa's pain kept private from me, zipped up and boxed, quelled, jarred, let out in jags maybe, or concealed in ordinary rages, stubbed toe or someone left a fan running. Never was he here and never my brother except in the hall, in the closet, in an old ghost story of impossible things, locked windows, door swollen in its jam, his terror of water, the fact he had never climbed over his crib rails and nevertheless that night climbed, past his mother who was not mine, past his father who became mine, all the impossibility arranged in its narrative skin, going always to memorized nowhere, as if the story itself always told the same or typed on his old compact, always the list of impossible facts years later might keep Papa from finding him that September morning, given its impossibility in the neighbor's pool. If no month September, if no night, no grass, no water, if no state Pennsylvania, if wood didn't release instantly its vapor and the door swing free, 
I never inquired how they loved him. He, no one to me, just the gone kid, never truly gone. Such long time went since. Time moving through the house, the night wet green underfoot, dew on his sleeping clothes, his feet. Time the whole, time shivering in red brown edges who ripple, then push in, drowning in the night. The lock outside my door, hook and I screwed tight when I turned to. So in the mornings, when I woke, I must cry out my upness, such little lungs fizzing in oxygen. Oh, thank you. Thank you. This, this poem moves me so deeply. And of course, the subject is tragic and very emotional. But I, I think that that's not what gets to me the most. It's the way in which you, um, in what, the way in which you've made this poem so that the poem reflects the experience so precisely all the way through. And I'm just amazed over and over again and, and the form, you know, the form is maybe created exactly so that you could write this poem. Uh, it, I, can, I can imagine it being used in other poems, but it just seems so exactly right for this poem. And I, when Miller and I were talking before this conversation, we were talking about sharing some of the ways that we just read a poem. And so I made some uh, marks on my copy of this poem that I'm going to ask to have screen shared. And, and I didn't make them really for teaching purposes. I made them just so that I, for myself, could observe what was happening in the poem more carefully. And so uh, this isn't yeah, this would be great. We can put them up now. Um, this isn't really the way you should mark up a poem or I, I didn't do this so I can point things out to you. But I thought it might be interesting because we try and see inside the writer's head a little bit, but I think it's interesting to try and see inside just another reader's head too. So that's just what we're going to do. And we're going to put the first page up and I'm assuming it's up now. If you can't see it, you should chat in the chat box. <laughs> so you can see in the beginning what happens here is the first thing that we get is Joshua was gone and in his place, one royal blue kid. So immediately we're told so much about who Joshua is. We know that he's a young child right here. And then all this detail about the father's shoes. So there's so many, these are just obvious things, but I, I, uh, I've I, kind of lived my whole life stating the obvious. And I find that actually it can be very useful. So here's all these shoes of the father's, but one shoe of Joshua's. And, and then the speaker comes, I sat there rarely and always alone to touch it. And I, I don't know that um, this is a very well-known poem, but there's, there's an amazing poem by James Hall called It Felt So Good, But Many Times I Cried. And he is in the closet. His mother has died, and he's touching his, his mother's fur. And it, it immediately, I just love the way these different poems talk to each other, the way in the previous poem, Tahara, Rilke was just right there. And when I came here, James Hall was just immediately there. And then we start to get into the that gorgeous lacquered dark and the smell comes in. So we're getting all this detail so that we are in the closet too. And then we have the direct reveal my dead brother's shoe. And then Miller moves the camera in. And this is something I talk to my students about a lot your camera is not locked into the middle ground. You can move it in, you can move it out. The zigzag tread, pretty worn, 
the dirty white rubber trim and shoe laces. And then in this next stanza, we it, he's managed to encompass the whole of a childhood uh, through these things that children do with, again, wonderful details. And then we get to the next stanza, only one picture. So we have only one shoe, we have only one picture. And it's, it's not even a picture just of him, it's in the corner of, of one collage. So it, it, there, there's even smaller, and then we come to these descriptions, which are both imaginative and actual and beautiful, bronze little fox, he looked out awarely. He looked like a toddler, face of a puzzle, face of a pit, face of an orchid, mouth of a plum, jaw of a hill waving wheat, chin of quince, neck of a gentle mountain, collarbone of wind over water. He's, he's, he's mixing up these dictions. You know, he looked like a toddler is just as straightforward as it could possibly be. But then there are these gorgeous descriptions. And I looked up Pip because I knew some things about what Pip means, but I was amazed at how many things Pip means. It's, I, I'm hogging this, Miller. Oh. Um, <laughs> what did you find out about Pip? I, I'm sorry, I'm just going on and on here. Uh, it's a small seed. Mm -hmm. It's one extraordinary of its kind. And it's a character, you know, he's a pip. And so this one tiny three letter word is all of those things. And then um, I'm gonna move a little more quickly so that Miller can say some things too. This, in the next stanza where he shifts and talks directly to the child, the, the, the brother who is dead, you, can I call you you? So he switches to this direct address and asks permission. And it's really interesting because in this James Hall poem, he asks permission of the fur. And this asking permission of the dead, I think is so interesting. I don't know that poem, but I can't wait to read it now. Did, maybe I should ask you a question before I go on and talk about the rest of this. Um, did that move happen naturally as just as you were writing? Were you aware that you wanted to switch it up then? What was what was that like there? And, that, and anything you want to say about the poem up till here too? Yeah, well, um, wait, is that right? H, yeah. It's, in the, oh. it's right at the top of the yeah, so I mean, this is like, for me, this is the magic of, of form because I couldn't use the letter H. And so I couldn't say his name, I couldn't say him. <laughs> and it sent me into second person. And so I it, didn't even think about that. it forces you to do these like odd things. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm so glad I asked you that. That is so <laughs> yeah. great. It yes. It you to be so much more inventive with language and syntax than you would normally be. Um, and I think that's like form rather than being um, being a prison can really, I, I just, I'm teaching a workshop this summer on form and I found this great Paul Muldoon quote about form that I was like amazed, amazed by, but he says something like, um, form is a straight jacket the way that a straight jacket was a straight jacket to Houdini. <laughs> oh. I was like, that's so perfect, right? It's like that's the thing great. that makes, you know, that you build something out of rather than that stops you. Um, and yeah. So this, yeah, it surprises us here. It adds another layer, uh, it goes, I think another layer deeper mm -hmm. into a kind of intimacy. Yeah. And um, it's so interesting to me too, how much we get a picture of the father mm -hmm. in this poem, mm -hmm. because of course he's, he's the one who's carrying this grief. Yeah. And then I want to talk a lot, well, not a lot, but some, about these last two stanzas, because here's where the form really ramps up. Mm -hmm. And we've got, I think, six nevers and three impossibles. 
and six no's. And this, <laughs> this morning I was recounting and I found one that I had even missed. It, we, we just have this absolute, and this is the railing, the railing against death. No, no, no. You know, it, it can't be. I, I think it's just incredible how this stanza is going over and over this deepest regret that uh, it, we get down to, you know, if there were, and, and if no month September, if no night, no grass, no water, no state Pennsylvania, you know, if all this didn't exist, then Joshua couldn't have died. And I think that what you capture here, we finally get to the exact story of the death, the climbing over the crib rails. But I think what you get to here is this universality of it can't be, and how can we unmake it? I think about the poem you read of unmaking. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how can we unmake this? And it's the climactic stanza uh, where there's this passionate, passionate uh, raging against death, but also one of the things that interests me is right in the middle here is arranged in its narrative skin, mm -hmm. going always to memorized nowhere. And this is, this it, to me, it, it's what good do the stories do? What good does, do the stories we tell ourselves do? And because I'm a person whose middle name is regret, this really speaks to me. And one of the things that I'm obsessed with and and try and you know work with as a person is to interrupt that process. Uh, but I I relate to this so strongly I think because that going over and over what can't be undone, you've managed through the language and the syntax to capture that. And then <clears throat> in this last stanza I think is where what happens with this form and the, the missingness, be, it becomes so apparent syntactically where everything is broken and falls apart and we can't have any natural syntax. We feel the broken syntax without the A, the broken hearts, the brokenness of the family, the brokenness of the father. And there's, there's no way to make whole sentences without the A. And the child, at the, on the very last page, page three, the child materializes, um, you know, due in his sleeping clothes, his feet. Um, and then this strange preventing of behaviors at the end, you know, the, the speaker having his door locked. Um, the lock outside my door, hook and I screwed tight when I turned two. So in the morning when I woke, I must cry out my upness. Such little lungs fizzing in oxygen. The speaker and the and Joshua become one in a in a way here at the end in these very awkward sentences are are so it seemed to me just so perfectly mirror the the brokenness and and the loss. Yeah, I think thank you. The form was so helpful there because with it without being able to use, for example, the word awake, right? Which would have been very useful to me trying to say what I was trying to say there. Um, it forces you to say things like cry out my upness. <laughs> Um, which is so awkward, um, but I think awkwardness is the friend of poetry, but you can't try to be awkward on purpose because that doesn't work. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think too, like do on his sleeping clothes, um, the inability to use a word like pajamas there, which would have been so much more obvious. Um, and, and so, yeah, I really, these to me are things that are gifts of the form because do on his sleeping clothes is, it almost sounds old fashioned, um, which works so well in the poem, um, but it's so, um, 
it's so clear too. It's not, um, yeah. Yes, it does sound old fashioned. It's like a, a night dress or something. Um, and yeah. the upness absolutely captures a child at that age. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. just, just uh, even though a child wouldn't say upness, mm -hmm. we get that sense of uh, one of the first words that my daughter learned to say was up when she wanted me to, you know, she would, she, she would cry, you know, mm, 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 you know, and I, I remember my, um, my sister-in-law teaching her the words up, say, yeah. say up. So you, she, yeah. yeah. Up. I think that um, with um, particularly, and I'm saying this for writers and not just poets, but certainly poets, um, when you have something that you're trying to write about and it's one of these stories that you've heard a million times, right? And it just feels impossible to get outside of that. Um, I think about uh, Walter Benjamin's definitions of memory, like voluntary memory and involuntary memory. And when you have these stories about you or stories about your family um, that have been told just like a gazillion times and they're always being trotted out, usually they're there for a reason, something really important happened. But at the same time, um, like it's so hard to get outside of them because they're so concretized. And when you have something like that, if you, if you use some, uh, some kind of form, use something to force yourself to go from a different angle, I think that's the only way to get at stories like that. Um, I think that's why for 15 years I couldn't write this poem, right? Like it was too, like um, it was too familiar and too unfamiliar at the same time and too important. And it always felt like overdone and um, really overwrought, like very overwrought drafts. Um, <laughs> like I have very overwrought drafts of a poem called like Joshua's Shoes from when I was 20. And it just couldn't work. Um, yeah. Yeah, form gives it this container. And here we see that the form uh, moves it to yeah. places that you couldn't consciously choose to go. Yeah. It's, it's an, a, such a brilliant and beautiful poem, Miller. Thank you. That's very, very kind. Um, oh. Yeah, I also think that there's like uh, different forms for different poems, like different forms are really good for different things. And sometimes you just have to try a bunch of things to breathe, breathe air into something. Yeah. But sometimes even it's something very simple, like mm -hmm. anaphora starting with yeah. the same word, which is, you know, way less technically challenging than this can still just give you a way to move through something that otherwise is this happened and then this happened and then this happened. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I want to say, I don't think this form is actually that hard to use. It sounds hard, but it's so much easier than it sounds. I think it's easier than all those forms where you have to count syllables and like, you know, use anapests or whatever, like count your, your rhythm and rhyme and syllables. Like that's really, really hard because um, you have to work every line to this high point of tension. And, it, and I think a lot of times people try those forms, those like Western European forms, like sonnets and sestinas. And um, what happens when you try to use those forms is you, um, you get trapped by them and you say things in ways that you don't want to say them uh, to you stay in the form. And it causes you to do things that are worse than what you would have done in free verse. And so then you go back to writing free verse, right? Um, and so I think like just trying different forms and seeing which ones are good for different things is really useful and, and fun. Um, I want to try this one. Oh, you have got to. Uh, I'm definitely going to try it. Yeah, I have two in my book, actually, too. There's, I have two others. Um, it's really, it's a really fun form. And they're very different and no one will ever know what you've done. <laughs> I, I wonder if you might talk just a little bit uh, because this is a form in which something is missing in each stanza, in just to, maybe more generally too, about the missing in poems or the silence in poems, what isn't said versus what is said. Yeah. Um, I think that is for me, like, it's interesting. Um, 
So it's a really good question. I'm thinking about it. It's like maybe the most important thing. Um, this poet, this great poet named Alice Fryman, I don't know if you know her yes. at all, but she was a teacher of mine in grad school. Um, and she used to say that poems are ghosts um, and that the only way you can see a ghost is by the like sheet over it, right? And the words are the sheet, but the words are not the poem. And so you have to make the sheet, the, the more sheer you can make the sheet, the thinner you can make the sheet, the closer you can get to seeing the ghost underneath it. And yeah, she's a great person. Um, and like, I really took that to heart. And I think that it was really useful to me thinking about what to reveal and what not to reveal. Um, and not to try to keep, because as a young person, I think I was always trying to do too much. Um, and I was, trying to make a point and trying to express my identity. And like, I think that for me, the ways to really do that was to pull back a little bit. And I didn't, and so like, for me, it's been a gradual process of learning to, to pull back a little bit. Um, oh, the name of the form is called the beautiful outlaw. Um, or if you would prefer it in French, the bell absent. Yeah, beautiful outlaw. And it's a new Ulipian form. Um, <laughs> and what does that mean? Um, Ulipo was a um, like mainly French and Italian um, literary movement. Um, if anyone's read Italo Calvino, he's probably the most famous writer who was. Mm -hmm. in that movement. It was it was um, writers and mathematicians, um, and so there's a lot of they invented a lot of forms. Um, in the mid 20th century and they're all pretty interesting um and they do weird weird stuff like um there's one called n plus seven where you circle every noun in your poem and you look up that noun in the dictionary and then you get the seventh next noun and you substitute your noun for the seventh next one um they were always doing <laughs> things like that um so their their forms are very fun um there's a, there's a website that you can go to that will do your N plus seven for you if you want to be lazy. Um, oh, why would you want to do that? <laughs> that would take all the fun out of it. Right. And of course, it's like different. Your poem changes based on whatever dictionary you use. Mm -hmm. um, I've never written a decent N plus seven, but um, I challenge anyone to try. Yeah, uh, beautiful outlaw. I wanted to ask you too, you're a scholar of old English. Sort of. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> could you could you tell us a little bit about what led you there and what your experience is there? And I know you've translated from Old English. Yeah, my book, The Unstill Ones, is about a maybe a third translations from Old English. Um, when I started um, my uh, PhD program in English, um, I was interested in Old English, and I read a couple of poems translated from Old English. Um, and I thought, these are incredible. Uh, who's translating them? And, and mainly they were translated by either medievalists um, who weren't really poets or by poets who were given sort of crib sheets by medievalists. Um, like, here's basically what the poem says, now you make it sound good. Um, and I'm a really big Anne Carson fan. And I thought, maybe I could breathe some life back into this the way that she has breathed life into Greek and Latin for us. Um, and so I started, I took a class and I started working um, on translations and I just really discovered um, sort of like, like working with form, it lets you have a friend, <laughs> like somebody's there to help you. And I'm really lazy. So I like to have somebody like there to help me. So I'm not sitting in front of an empty page, not knowing what to do. Um, and I think going back to the origins of my mother tongue was really fruitful for me. Um, learning about things like um, the way that they combine words to make new words is very, very fun um, and exciting and like kind of re-enlivened my own use of language. Um, but I particularly thought, and, and I'm saying this to any students who are listening, like I looked at it and I was like, who's translating this stuff, right? who's reading this? 
Um, are they queer people? Are they trans people? Are, there, are they Jewish people? Are they feminist people? Are they people of color? Like who's getting to do this and why should we seed um, something like the beginning of our own language to like, you know, these crusty, <laughs> not that there aren't some great crusty old cis white dudes, because there are, um, but, but a lot of medievalists are very conservative. Um, and I thought, why should we let them be the ones um, to translate our own poems, like our own, histor our own history for us? Um, and as some of you un undoubtedly know, um, the white nationalist movement uses uh, Old English runes um, as some of their symbols. And I, I saw things like that and I was just like, they don't get to have this. Um, this, is not, this does not belong to them. Um, this can belong to us. And so I wanted to like kind of put a foot in there. I love that. I love that. Can you talk a little bit about the way they combine words that you just mentioned? Yeah, word compounding um, it's called. And you'll see it a lot if anyone who reads German too, because it's very Germanic. Um, if you read any Paul Salon, you'll know that he puts shoves a bunch of words together to make new words all the time. Um, and we can do that in English too. Um, so if they didn't have a word for something, they would just join two words. And a good example is for a joint, like in your body, they didn't have the word for elbow or knee. So they joined the words bone and the word lock. And so a joint in Old English is bon lock, um, a bone lock. Um, or a chest, your chest uh, would be called your heart kofa, which is like a heart coffer. Um, would be the word for like a rib cage. And so you get these beautiful, very literal, you would love it, Ellen, it's very literal. Um, highly literal, just descriptions of things that also sound incredibly poetic and amazing. Um, Those would be great to just put right in your poem. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You could just thieve, yeah. That's what you yeah, do. I want to do that. <laughs> I was like, I'll take these. Um, really? It influenced my poems a lot. Um, I use a lot of word compounds, but sometimes they're just stolen, or sometimes I make them up. Um, but yeah, I think that um, my students know this because I teach a poetry and translation course, but I think what's beautiful about translation is that um, it should be an equal exchange. Um, and you should have, you should not have more reverence for your language, um, which people in translation studies would call the target language. You should not have more reverence for that than the language you're translating out of. And you should allow your own language to be changed by the language that you're translating. And if you're not willing to let your own language be changed, if you only want to change someone else's language, um, it's not very just and it's not very fair. Um, and it's, you know, you're a colonizing force. Um, in some cases more than in others, whether it's a colonizing force of the past or a colonizing force of another um, person's literature. Um, and so I think instead you can have this very beautiful exchange where you allow your own language to be affected. And we have to be affected, um, you know, by what, by what we love. Sounds like relationship. Exactly. It's very like, um, like Buber's I and Now. I don't know if you know that text, but that's an important book for me. And he talks about relationships as I and thou, um, not I and you or I and they or them, um, but how to have that equality um, between you. Yeah. That's wonderful. Um, I, I know we're getting yeah. close to, to the end. I wonder, um, I wonder if we could hear a translation. Yeah. And then I don't know if... Um, Oh, maybe there are questions. A chat window if there are a lot of uh, questions, but I'll read one really short translation um, that I was talking about in one of my classes the other day. Uh, this poem's called Cadman's Hymn. Maybe before you read it, I'm just yeah. gonna break in and say, if you do have questions, if you could type them into the chat room, then after Miller reads this poem, we could um, uh, ask some of those questions to him. Cool, it sounds like there's not a lot of questions yet. So um, I'll read this, this poem called Cadman's Hymn, um, which is said to be the first poem written in English, which is probably not true, but I like to believe that it's true. Um, and the story about it, which is probably a lie, is that Cadman, an illiterate herdsman, was 
sitting around after dinner with his friends and they were drinking and they all said poems, but he didn't have a poem. He couldn't read. And so he went and fell asleep in the barn with the animals um, and God gave him this poem when he woke up and um, uh, Cadman's him. Now we will honor the heaven kingdom's keeper, the measurer's might and his mind thoughts, the work of the wonder father as he wrought boundless Lord, the beginning of every beauty. The first poet made for the souls of soil, heaven for a roof, holy maker. After that, mankind's keeper made middle earth, master almighty, eternal Lord, earth for everyone. Um, so there's the first poem written in English. And um, a phrase to pay careful attention to in that poem is um, the first poet made for the souls of soil. The word in Old English for poet and maker or creator are the same, um, shelp. And so in my translation, I translated literally the first poet. And I had never seen any other translation of this poem do that. They just say um, the creator, which is a way we're commonly um, accustomed to hearing God referred to as the creator. Um, and this poem really is just a praise, a like string of praise words for God, which is what you ex would expect since God gave him the poem, um, that it would be that way. But I think this idea of thinking of God as the first poet, I, I was like, that's so beautiful. Um, and, and it is what it says. And I was like, this is the kind of thing that's being lost. Um, and I, and, you know, yeah. Thank you for saving it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I love the idea of, uh, I struggle with the idea of God, but if you, but if it's the first poet, I can start to, I can start to get more down with that. Mm, me too. Me yeah. too. And you notice a lot of um, compound words in there, mind thoughts. That's a very common um, Old English compound word, the idea of mind thoughts, which we would never say that, but it's cool that they did. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Um, yeah. So there's some, there's some questions. Should I read them to you or? Yeah, I can see them too. Okay. Uh, so this question is, should the translator be neutral to their own ideological or cultural biases? In that case, why do you make the distinction between conservative or queer is for progressive translators? Um, well, I don't think that um, humans are capable of neutrality, I guess, is my answer to that question. So, I mean, when you read things, people are, um, when you, if you really look into any translation, I think you do find people's cultural biases in them um, a, a lot. And so, um, yeah, I don't think that's possible. I think what a translator can do um, is try as hard as they can, and then also acknowledge what they've done um, and, and kind of say what they've done. Yeah. <laughs> In Joshua was gone, I'd love to hear your comments about the particular challenges of writing about tra tragic events in relation to cliche and melodrama. Um, that's a great question. Uh, coming from the upstairs of my own house, I should add. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that like trying to write about things, things that feel like melodrama is just incredibly difficult. And I, I would say that my answer to that is form because I was totally unable to do that um, in a way that was satisfactory to me um, before I had a form to work with. Um, and so I think I would advise to anyone trying to write about things that, um, that feel that way, um, that have that difficulty, that tend towards cliche, to find to find a sort of way to tell it slant, um, to find another way in, I think is helpful. Yeah. Um, how important is it to stick with a form that you choose? It's interesting when a form is used, but then broken. If breaking a form is a choice you might make, how sparingly would you make that choice? That's an awesome question, um, Grace. Um, yeah, I don't think it's important to stick with it past its own utility. So I, 
what I love about poetry and what I think is probably the most difficult thing about poetry is that you have to reinvent the wheel every time. Every time you write a poem and it works out and you feel good about it, then you just have to start again. Um, and so I think that every poem kind of like tells you um, how to work on it. And so if you feel like you should break out of a form because it is ceasing to be productive, um, I would break out as much as you want, you know? Um, I think seeing what's productive, if you're just wrestling with it, like this is so hard, but it feels like a good wrestling, um, then keep wrestling. But if it doesn't feel like it, do something else. Yeah, it's my advice. Ellen, what do you think? Exactly the same, exactly the same. Um, I think that sometimes the value of a form is just to be able to get you started in a certain way. And I've, uh, I've, uh, done that sometimes and then let go of the form such that you'd never know that there ever was a form in the first place, even that far because, but it helped me, it helped me get going. And I think in this poem in Joshua was gone, it seems really clear that it wouldn't have been a good idea to let go of that form at any time because Miller could never have gotten to that broken syntax of the end if he said okay i'm going to let myself have uh awake in here uh, mm -hmm. so the the form was really guiding him and like you say he was helping you write the poem the form but but yeah everything is there to be used and i always tell my students you know you're not trying to do a perfect exercise you're trying to make the best poem you can make yeah yeah every tool that you can find you can use and um, and I think too, um, like free verse is, is not a non-choice. Like every poem has form, um, even if it's just a form that you're inventing for that poem. Um, and I think in the same way as me, as as doing nothing is a political choice that we all know about, um, taking no action is a choice, and and using free verse is a choice. And I, I think we can look to every single free verse poem and ask, what is this poem's form to? Um, yeah. Uh, what other forms do I like? Um, well, for one thing, I'll say about the N plus seven, the person said I, I mentioned that the N plus seven hadn't been very fruitful. I would say that it's been fruitful. It just didn't result in any good poems that I would show another person. <laughs> I think that sometimes like the kind of mistakes and disasters um, poems that you work hard on or text or an essay that you work hard on, um, that can be really fruitful for you, even if it never kind of pans out. Um, failures can be really helpful and you can learn kind of skills and tools from them. Um, so I would say um, another form that I have found to be some one that I like is a something called the pantoum. I really like that form. Um, which is, you can look it up and find it, P-A-N-T-O-U-M, um, is a kind of a great form where lines like circle throughout, um, cycle throughout. It's a good form. And another one um, that I like is the huzzle. is a really great form too um, that I have found useful. We have uh, one more question and then maybe that will draw to an end. Yeah. Um, this is another question about, uh, the question is on the topic of colonialism. Should English poems only be translated by Englishmen, German by Germans, et cetera, et cetera. Can you elaborate what you meant by colonialism in translation? Um, I think that's a great question uh, and important for every person to really, really think about depending on their work. Um, I think that, no, I don't, I don't feel ready to say that only people of a particular identity should be doing particular things, but I do think there are limits to what we should be doing um, that we have to kind of find in ourselves. Um, the, the question as to about colonialism, I would say is that if you're taking someone's literature and using it for your own purposes and not giving anything back, um, the, fact that, um, the fact that there's, it's incredibly hard to find any um, literary translations by um, translators of color of, of 
writers of color throughout the world that are published is is an incredibly huge problem. Um, so I do think that if you're a white person, you should think really hard um, before translating the work of someone else. Um, and think about what you're really think about the choice that you're making. I don't think that anyone can translate anything. Um, but I but I'm not I'm not ready to say that like you can only do you. Um, Cause I'm not even sure like where that get where that gets us. Um, can I not translate old English because I live in the 21st century? Um, like I think the purpose of literature is to some extent communicative. But when you're translating, um, when you're translating, you're actually like taking on someone else's voice. And that is a that is a very, very um, big thing to do. And so I think it should be undertaken really seriously. Yeah. Um, this is one more question squeaked in. Maybe you would answer it and 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 then we will we yeah. will uh, close. Yeah, um, I would say try the beautiful outlaw, try the pantoum, try the chazal. I think try a sonnet. Sonnets are incredible. Um, I think the Shakespearean sonnet is an amazing form to practice. Actually, um, I don't recommend anyone write sestinas. I think it's a bad idea. <laughs> uh, I, think it's a bad, I think it's a bad form. <laughs> Um, I don't like Elizabeth Bishop's Sestina that much. And that's like, she's a god. So um, thank you all so much for- I, I love I love ending with, with, with you <laughs> dissing the Sestina. That seems like a perfect ending, Miller. <laughs> I love this book. This oh, book, thank you. And that Ellen sent me in the mail and I put it in quarantine for three days and then I- have been very close to it ever since because next week at the same time we're gonna flip um and ellen's gonna read some poems from from her new book that just just came out and it's so beautiful and amazing um and ellen's gonna read some poems and then i'm gonna get to talk about them and ask you questions about them and so we'll just do this again um thank you so much miller and thank you all for being here with us this has been for me a wonderful conversation. I hope you've enjoyed it too. Yeah. Um, I, this has been the best part of my day for sure. Um, and um, thank you so much to everyone for coming and thank you to Scott um, for putting this together and to the New School for continuing to host us from our homes. Um, and I hope that you all will come back next week for our um, next craft lesson lunch here at Eugene Lang Remote. Okay, thank you.